I don't think anybody goes through life without having some difficulties. The old song says, into each life a little rain must fall. And it certainly is true, and uh, some people just have maybe little drizzles. In Pennsylvania, they call it spritz. But uh, some people have tremendous problems that come up in their lives. And uh, it's important for us to, I th you know, the first talk I gave here was interpreting meanings, you know, the meanings of things. And it really helps if we understand what's going on and why it's going on. Viktor Frankl talked about that, about being in a concentration camp. And you can take a lot of stuff, you can take a lot of guff if you know why, if you can see some reason for it, and if you can see that somehow or other something good is going to come of it. But sometimes it doesn't look like that when things are happening. And if we get too much of it all at one time, then we begin to wonder sometimes, does God really love us? Is he still loving us? And if he's loving us, why is this happening? Why is God doing this? Well, he's not really doing it. He's just allowing it. Well, why is he allowing it? If he loves me, why does he let these horrible things happen to me? Does he really love me? And yes, he does really love me. It took a little Jewish boy from Brooklyn who probably didn't even know the Lord to write a song in his ballet, An American in Paris, and the song, I just take right away from George Gershwin. And I say, that wasn't George Gershwin. He just thought it was. He thought it was George and Ira, but it really wasn't. It was Jesus. He just didn't know it. Jesus is singing to us tonight, letting us know how he feels about us, even though the rug came out from under us and everything may be going wrong at one time or another. He wants us to know. And so he says to us, our love is here to stay. So let that be a lesson to you. Not all of us can be volleyball champs. <laughs> but if we play another game, <clears throat> I'd like to read from the Gospel of Luke now. Just want us to keep thinking about the fact that God does love us even when it seems like everything's gone wrong. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 23 verses 32 through 43 we read this. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him, 
and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him vinegar and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. What an understatement. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you the Christ? Well, then save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly? For we're receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. What a sweet word that was. See, that man knew where his kingdom was. He knew where Jesus... That's a tremendous faith statement. To hang on the cross next to Jesus and say, after everybody mocked him about, if you're the king, do this, and if you're the king, do that, and if you're the king, do this... This man knew better. He said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But I want to, there's a lot to, to say about that passage, but I really don't want to take the time to do that. I'd like to hear Bobby do that. I, when, he, when he takes a piece of scripture and he just takes me right into the place. I'm there. CBS, you were there. I'm there. But I just want to focus on, on one thing. I want to narrow the scope a minute to make a point, and that is that Jesus hangs on the cross, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, they knew what they were doing. They, they very deliberately drove the spikes in. So they knew what they were doing, but they didn't really know what they were doing. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What I want to talk about tonight is simply Forgive the wounds. When Alice and I were at college at Lebanon Valley, that's uh, where I bought that waste basket for five bucks. That was the big moment of my year. Well, it turned out I still have that trash can. When I speak anywhere in Pennsylvania, I take that trash can with me. I love it. It's all banged up and bent out of shape and rusty and the, the seam has come loose. But it takes all the trash I give it. Forgive the wounds. When we, Alice and I got married after my junior year in college. She was one year ahead of me in high school. And so she graduated and did one year of college, and I, then I came out and did three years in the Marine Corps. We were even Stephen, but she had to pay back by teaching two years in the state of Pennsylvania, or else she had to give back the scholarship money she had. That was part of the deal. So we waited two more years to get married. I mean, because it was $800. Two years for $800 isn't bad. So I went to college for two years, and after my sophomore year, we got married. And I brought Alice up to Anvil, Pennsylvania. She taught two years in Virginia in public schools. It was either first or second grade. Then I brought her up to Anvil, and she got a job in North Anvil teaching either first or second grade. And it wasn't long before I began to notice she was getting a little big. And she got bigger and bigger and bigger. She got so big. <laughs> she got so big that she was afraid that if one of the kids at school where she taught would accidentally stick her with a pencil, she'd just burst. 
And I mean, she really, this was unusual. This was not the usual thing. And after a while, Dr. Silverstein and Anvil said, I think it might be good for you to go see Dr. Paust over in Lebanon. He's a specialist. And so Alice and I went to Dr. Paust. And while we were in the waiting room, Alice did something I'd never seen her do. And I didn't see her do it then. She told me about it later. She was reading a magazine in the waiting room, and she found a poem in there that she really liked, so she just tore the page out and stuck it in her pocketbook. <laughs> now, this is totally un-Alice stuff. Alice is so honest, never mind. <laughs> I mean, it really is difficult to live with a woman like that. You can't exaggerate, you can't do anything. I mean, she'll say, Alex, and then I have to tell the truth. That's the reason I don't bring her to CFOs. <laughs> so anyway, uh, she did this. See, that's totally uncharacteristic. Alice is an extremely honest woman, and she's a delight. I'll tell you, I love being with someone like that. And she did this, and, and I didn't know about it, but at any rate, she was examined by Dr. Paust, and Dr. Paust uh, made his report later. He says, what you have is you have acute poly polyhydramnus. And I thought, he doesn't even know her that well. <laughs> I thought she had acute everything. <laughs> but I didn't know what it meant, and neither did Alice. Alice said, well, what is acute polyhydramnus? He says, it simply means there's too much water in the bag. She said, well, why would that be? He said, well, it, it may be that there's something wrong with the boys. <laughs> she said, with the what? He said, that's right, there are two of them. And, it's, and, and we're pretty sure that it's boys. And uh, he said, sometimes when there's something wrong, uh, there'll be too much water and, the, and it will break early. You see, God is the only abortionist. He knows what he's doing, and he does it right. Well, we, we hope that it would work out well. We didn't really know the Lord or anything, you know. We might have said one of those prayers like you say before exams. Lord, help me pass this, and I'll, I'll always study for every other exam from here on. He knows about those. <clears throat> so do we all. And maybe we flipped up one out there somewhere in case somebody was listening. But time went on and Alice got bigger and bigger and finally the day came and, and I drove her into the hospital and after a little while, Alexander was born. Alexander. <laughs> And just a little bit later, here came Fontaine. Now Fontaine was, Alice's mother's maiden name was Fontaine. There are a number of Fontaines down in Virginia. They're French Huguenot background. Matthew Fontaine Maury during the Civil War charted the ocean currents, and you don't care. But at any rate, <laughs> uh, here came Fontaine. Well, I looked at them, and there they were. There were two little boys, and they were in an incubator. And uh, I had. they said, now you can come and see Alexander and Fontaine. And I came, and, and I looked at them, and there they were, little beggars. Fingernails, everything. Everything was there. Fantastic. <laughs> A real piece of work. And then uh, just a few hours, Alexander died, and a little bit later, Fontaine, and they were gone, but I did get to see them. Dr. Paust was Roman Catholic, and when he delivered Alexander and Fontaine, he told Alice, he said, they're all, there's just no way they're going to make it. We're going to do everything we can, but we don't expect that they're going to make it. He said, would you like to name them? And Alice said, well, we're going to name them Alexander and Fontaine. He said, 
well, I'm Roman Catholic. Would you like me, for me to baptize them? And Alice said, well, yeah, I, yeah. So Dr. Paust baptized them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and the next day, the funeral director and a Lutheran pastor by the name of Harry Richwine and I stood on the side of a hill in Lebanon, Pennsylvania and heard a few words in a little coffin the size of a shoebox with the remains of Alexander and Fontaine were put down in the ground and covered over and a little metal cross was stuck there. And I saw Professor Stackow the next day on the stairs over in the conservatory. I was majoring in music ed. He was my clarinet professor. And I was on my way zooming up the steps to some class or other. And here came Professor Stackow down on the other side. Now, you've got to understand Frank Stackow had 11 children. And uh, as I passed him, he grabbed me by the arm. He says, Alex, he said, I'm so sorry to hear about the tragedy. And I couldn't think what he was talking about. And so I just decided not to say anything. And uh, he, he talked a little bit more. And then I realized he was talking about Alexander and Fontaine. And yes, it, it, it was a sad situation. I mean, they were the little boys, you know. And, and I, when I saw them, I loved them. I didn't have to even get to know them. I didn't have time to get to know them, but I loved them when I saw them. After all, they were little people, and they were little kids, and they were ours, and then they were gone. It's kind of sad, but what can you do about it? And if you don't know what to do about it, and you don't know anyone to help you about it, all you can do is just say, well, that's the way the cookie crumbles, and that's the way life is, and let's take the stoic attitude, and bite the bullet and let's get on with business. There, there's other things going on in the world. And so in that way, I would sort of pushed it off and, and Alice was doing sort of the same thing and, and that was it. And Frank Stackow was talking, he was all broken up about it. And I thanked him. Later I found out, Alice told me, she says, Alex, she's from Virginia, she says, Alex, I have to tell you something terrible I did. I said, what did you do? She said, I stole something, and I couldn't believe it. And she told me that she ripped this page out of the magazine. She said, I'd like to read to you the poem. In fact, she didn't even read it. She recited it. But it's Alice's story, and I, I don't know it from memory, so I'm going to read it. It's called The Redwood Tree. The Redwood Tree. The redwood tree forgives a wound and builds a burl upon it from which a craftsman makes a bowl as lovely as a sonnet. And from this I learn, if I'm wise, to be alike forgiving and build within my wounded heart a loveliness of living. And then God will make of my true heart, just like the redwood story, with his great love and craftsmanship, a chalice to his glory. And I think that's a great poem. See, a redwood tree forgives a wound. That's why we have those beautiful salad bowls. Where the wound is, that's where the burl grows. From that, they make these beautiful salad bowls. And God's willing to make a beautiful salad bowl of us. But I mentioned the other night there are three kinds of people in this world, you remember? I don't know when I mentioned it, but I mentioned that there were three kinds of people in this world. How many people, how many of you know how many kinds of people there are? How many of you know what those people are, the three kinds of people in the world? Well, the ones who have your hands down, I know which kind you are. Remember I told you they're the people who make things happen, the people who watch things happen, and the people who don't know anything happened. Okay, but that's just a, a little clever way that somebody said something. 
But now we could look at, at people, uh, just for convenience sake, as two ways of dealing with life. And one way is to receive it. To receive it. Jesus didn't resist the spikes. He received them. There must have been a welcoming in, in a sense. Yes, it hurt, and I'm, I would imagine that he really sh yelled with pain. He despised the shame of it. Uh, looked forward to the joy, accepted it with joy, but he received it. And he forgave the wounds. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And, there, and you, we can do that. Or we can take the other position. It's not fair. What did I ever do? What did Alice ever do? How come our children died? Two boys. Never get to know Alexander. Never get to know Fontaine. It's not fair. What did we do wrong? And if God loved us, it couldn't be happening. Who are we going to forgive? Who did us wrong? And just go around singing one of those he done me wrong songs. What are we going to do? There are two ways to deal with it. Receive it, forgive the wound, or spend the rest of our lives resisting and gnarling up and not accepting and denying and stuffing it down and not dealing with it. Well, uh, there are two ways. Let's go to chapter 6 of Dr. Luke again. This is Luke chapter 6. I've taken a, a, a few verses here, and I've chosen to group them. Sometimes they group them differently in the Bible, but you know there aren't any chapters, and there aren't really any verses in the Bible. Those are just thrown in for convenience. And they're thrown in based on how the person who did it thought that units of thought were. But I'm going to take it this way. And I'm going to read Luke chapter 6, verses 36 through 38. And this is Jesus speaking. And he says, be merciful, even as your father is merciful. Judge not, and you'll be not judged. Condemn not, and you'll not be condemned. Forgive, you'll be forgiven. Give, and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get. That's a good way to look at it. What would anybody say about my only brother Mitch getting polio when he was 14 years old. They did tell us not to swim in the James River Canal, that you could get polio, but it's so swift in there. It's a great place to swim. We had a tree with a rope. We'd swing out and drop down, and before you knew it, you were half a mile down or a mile down the stream. It was great. And Mitch was the one who got polio. They didn't even catch it at first. He had a terrible headache. Took him into the Medical College of Virginia, down in downtown Richmond. And they discovered he had spinal meningitis. And they caught that. There was no polio vaccine. They hadn't discovered such a thing at that time. They called it infantile paralysis or polio, or in this case, spinal meningitis. It was a couple of days later they discovered he had polio in his right leg. Somehow or other, the, the meningitis was healed, but the polio stayed, and from then on, I knew Mitch as a person who limped the rest of his life. And St. Christopher's School for Boys no longer had their fastest end on the football team. They told Mitch, uh, said, you're going to have to use these crutches, and you might never get rid of them. He said, the hell I won't. That was the way Mitch dealt with things. And after a while, he threw away the crutches, and they said, well, we're, we're going to outfit you with a, a, a leg brace 
that you can lock and unlock so you can hinge it and sit down and get up. And you use a cane. And they said, but you'll always need that cane. He said, that's what you think. And after a while, he threw away the cane. And they said, well, you're, you're certainly doing very well, but obviously your leg doesn't have any strength and you'll, you'll always need the leg brace, just like Franklin Roosevelt. Mitch said, well, you got another guest coming. Time went on and he threw the brace away. And he was able to walk. And he could walk around and he continued to grow, but his right leg didn't. And he had a big, thick heel in his shoe the rest of his life. And I watched him one day, the first time he tried his bike. It was in the front yard, leaning against the tree, and I happened to be looking out the window. And I watched my childhood hero go over to his bike and pick it up and throw his body over it, push off with his good leg, and go maybe three or four feet and fall over. And he never touched his bicycle again, never said anything about it. What do you do about stuff like that? I, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't know what to do about any of it. I cried when I watched him. But I didn't ask him about it, and he never mentioned it. My dad was an alcoholic, as you know, and my mother had shock treatments because she couldn't handle it. That's what they did in those days. And uh, you heard me tell a little bit about it. And uh, he, uh, I guess, well, after I graduated school and all of that and began teaching, I think it must have been around uh, 1971 or 72, I got a call from Mitch on the telephone down in Virginia. Now, Mitch lived in Pennsylvania by then. He was head of an ac of, uh, uh, accident department of an insurance company, and he lived in Warrington, Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia. And uh, he called, he said, uh, Daddy's not doing too well, and I think you better come. I said, really? He says, yeah, and I think you better leave right away. So I went down to Virginia. Now, what had happened is they'd taken him out of the alcoholic sanitarium brought him over to Stewart Circle Hospital. He was dehydrated, but they, they worked that out real quick. But he had pneumonia, and he also had cirrhosis of the liver. It was the alcohol. And they had him in an oxygen tent, and they said, uh, doesn't look good. And I stood looking at him, and uh, just didn't have any feeling. I had no sadness, I had no joy, I had no peace, I had no anger. Nothing, at least I couldn't identify anything. I just stood there looking at him and wondering why I was so neutral about it. And I just stood and watched him die. And you know, I'd made a vow when I was about 10 or 11 that I wouldn't love him anymore. It was too painful. Be easier just if he didn't exist. Because you see, I did love him. And he was wonderful when he wasn't drinking. But when he was drinking, he'd hang all over me and say, I love you, I love you. And the more he did that, the more I hated it. Because I felt if you loved me, you wouldn't be like that. You know that nobody wants that. You know that I don't appreciate having to call in to work and lie for you and say he's got laryngitis when he's dead out drunk in the bed for two weeks, unconscious. And all kinds of embarrassment and humiliation and shame and, and uh, you know, so I, I just, after a while, I just, you know, love and then disappointment and love and disappointment. I just said later for that, click, that's it for him. You know, I can deal with other people. But it doesn't work that way. 
When you decide to stop loving a person, you stop loving humanity. And it affects every relationship you'll ever have. And certainly if it's your own dad, that's you. Mitch didn't feel that way. Mitch said, he's a good old boy, just drinks a bit too much. Well, Mitch was older and he could go out. He could just leave when he couldn't handle it. But I was younger and I had to stay home with my mother and deal with that. And that was difficult. Well, that's not to say that, that, you know, that Mitch had it easier. Not at all. He just had a different way of seeing it. And the way I saw it caused me to do what I did. And that's the way it ended. And a few years later, I met Jesus, as I told you. And uh, a few months, uh, just a bit after that, I went to, to Camp Farthest Out on Long Island. I listened to a Presbyterian minister by the name of Jim Brown tell about the love of Jesus and a, and a Scottish lady named Amy Carmichael. Is that the name? The one who went to, to India. Well, anyway, I heard about 10 minutes and got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I never had a chance to ask. I would have asked, <clears throat> but it was like the household of Cornelius. And a couple of months later, I attended a full gospel businessman fellowship international. That's Figa Bumphy. I figured I, I, I attended their regional, the New York regional, at uh, the Americana Hotel in Manhattan class. And I was excited. I went in, they gave me a disc and said 138. And I looked through the double doors into the big ballroom where the banquet was going to be. And I found table number 138 way down front and over to the side, to the right side. And Demas Shikarian was going to speak. Oh, I thought I had arrived, man. This was it. I was so excited. Now, I didn't go with anybody, but I just went and I was excited to be there. There are a lot of people around. I'd never been to a big charismatic event like this. And I was so glad to be with other spirit-filled Christians, and I was up on the mountain, you know, Moses and, and Elijah had nothing on me. I was up there, and I went in and, and looked for my table, and I found it. And I went and sat down at the table, and there were three or four ladies there, and I looked over and I said, hi there, Jesus is great, isn't he? She says, well, yes, he is. And I thought, well, uh, I spoke to the next lady. Uh, Good morning. It's great to be a Christian, isn't it? Yes, it is. I looked at my number. I said to the next lady, uh, how are you? Nice to see you. Praise the Lord. She said, yes. And I realized they'd put me at the dud table. I didn't know why. I wondered about it a little bit. And I thought, well, look, I'm not going to let, I don't know who they are. They obviously aren't Christians. Because if you're a Christian, you run around shouting glory and hallelujah and all the other buzzwords. And, you know, you're in there, man. You're on the mountain. I knew what that was because before I was a Christian, I wasn't like that. And since I'd become a Christian, for two months, I was up on that mountain building tabernacles. It was great. And I thought that was the difference between being a, a, an undecided and being a I gave my life to Jesus guy. So I didn't know what was wrong with those women. About that time, an old man came over and sat down next to me. Now, I had seen this guy before. He was tall and he was very thin and he was wearing a Cambridge gray wool suit. Now, nobody wears that anymore and they didn't wear it much in those days but he was very distinguished looking. 
and uh, had very erect posture. He had completely white hair, a full head of white hair, and he had a, a white mustache and a, a little uh, Van Dyke. And he looked for all the world like a skinny Colonel Sanders. <laughs> Striking man, very tall. This is the one who came over and sat down, and when he sat down, I looked at him, and he must have been 80 years old. I thought, what, what do you do with anybody like that? What's he doing here? You know, I got three women who, who are definitely in some other mode, and a guy who is just about on his way out, and this is my table. And I hated to say anything to him after I'd gotten the report from the other three or four, but, you know, what do you do with a guy who's 80? What, what, what do you do with them? I didn't know how old he was, but, I mean, he was old. He was so old. Well, I decided to say hello. So, and I decided not to gill the lily too much. I didn't want to be disappointed. So I just said, hello. He said, hi, how are you? Praise the Lord. I said, right. Amen. He's great, isn't he? He said, oh, wonderful. He's wonderful. And I told him, I'm Alex McCullen. He told me his name. And I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. I said, no kidding. I grew up in Richmond. He said, is that a fact? I said, yeah. I said, uh, where, where, uh, how do you happen to be at this meeting? He said, well, I came to New York to attend this conference. I said, who'd you come with? He said, I came by myself. I said, how did you get here? He said, I came up on the train. He said, as a matter of fact, I'll probably have to leave before the meeting is over because I have to make a four o'clock train. So he said, if you see me leave, don't be alarmed, but I just want you to know ahead of time, if I go out and I don't come back, well, I'm glad he told me that. <laughs> I said, where do you live down there in, in Alexandria? I figured he's probably at some home or something. He said, I live with my son and my daughter-in-law. I said, how does that go? Does that work out pretty well? He said, wonderful. He says, I have a little room in the back, and, and I have a little TV and a little air conditioner. He says, I go in and out, have my own entrance exit there. And he said, uh, I said, uh, do, do you get along well, you and your son and your daughter-in-law? He said, we get along great. He says, I do my things, they do their things, and we eat our meals together, and works out real well. I said, well, that's neat. I said, what do you do down there? He said, well, I'm active with my church, and he told me a little bit about his church, and he said, I'm an a active member of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International Chapter, and he said, I'm, uh, I, I'm very busy with Meals on Wheels, and I didn't know what that was, so he told me all about that. And I thought, wow, look at this guy. He's beautiful. I don't know how old he is, but he's ancient, you know? And he's just so full of life, just so full of life. Vivacious, great conversationalist. Just, I was so glad to be with him. About that time, Demas Shikarian began to speak, and he was given a great message, and, and after a few minutes, I wasn't there anymore. Now, I can't explain exactly, I don't even know exactly what happened, but I can only tell you the part that I perceived. And I can tell you that I read a passage written by Paul. Thank God for Paul. He helped me to find out that Jesus is Lord. And Paul said, I knew a man who was taken into the third heaven. And he's talking about himself. And I don't know exactly what happened, but I'll just tell you the part that I, that I experienced. In the midst of Demas Shikarian speaking, I wasn't in the ballroom anymore. I was in a different place. And the place was absolutely silent. It's as though it had snowed for a long time. And it's kind of like when you're out in the woods and the snow is a foot and a half deep and it's fresh and it's all on the branches. 
and there's lots of trees and shrubs. It's that kind of silence. You know, that close, thick, total silence. That's what the silence was like. What did it look like? Well, there, there was light, but it was misty gray, sort of pearly gray. And I couldn't see any source for the light, but there was just, there was just enough light. It wasn't very bright, but it was misty gray, very misty, light gray. I said, God, are you there? And there was no answer. I said, God, isn't it funny you think if you talk a little louder, he'll hear you? I said, God, are you there? And there was no answer. I said, is Daddy there with you? And there wasn't any answer. I said, well, God, I don't know if you're supposed to pray for people after they die. In fact, I think you're not supposed to. That's what I thought at the time. I said, but I'm going to pray for my dad anyway, and if you don't like it, you'll have to deal with me. I said, if he's not with you, would you take him to be with you? Which violated all the theology I had developed at that stage of my life. If he's not with you, will you take him to be with you? And God, will you forgive my dad? And I forgive him. And will you forgive me for waiting so long? And the next thing I saw was the old man standing right in front of me. And I guess he was leaving. And I stood up and Demas Shikarian was still speaking. This old man and I put our arms around each other and we both just wept and wept and wept for the longest time. And he left and went out the door, and I never saw him again. That's healing the wounds. Forgiving the wounds. Forgive the wounds. It's easy to do when God does something. And I love my dad. I love him and I respect him. Mitch McCullough from Pickens, Mississippi, down in the Delta. And he got stuck on alcohol. And I don't know how that happened. I don't know what his childhood was like. I don't know what it was like having the parents that he had or living in the place he lived. And I don't know what it was like to, to, to have a fast rise to success in the Big Apple. I don't know anything about what his life was that brought him to what he was. And what right did I have to say that I can drink and not be a drunk, but he's got to be a disgusting alcoholic? I had no right. I knew, I knew nothing. Many times I've said to God, depart from me. I'm an ignorant man. And that's one of them. And I respect my dad. Bobby Burns says a man's a man for all of that. That's my man. That's my dad. I'm looking forward to seeing him again someday. And he's not going to stand before me and say, I'm Mitch, an alcoholic. He's going to say, hi, son. And I'll say, hi, dad. Class. Let's go to the scriptures, Romans chapter 8, verses 8 through 18 through 28, considerable slice. Paul says, I reckon, so you know he was from down south, <laughs> or I consider, or I take it to be. He says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God or the sons of God. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning and travail together until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that's seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, if we hope for it, we wait with patience. Likewise, the Spirit himself helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts of men knows that it, what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that in everything, God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. I just gave you my life verse. That's, that's my verse right there. Romans 8, 28. It may be a lot of people's verse, but it's my verse. I'm totally persuaded beyond the shadow of a doubt that everything that happens to me works together for good. Because I qualify. I love God. I don't love him the way I ought to. I sure don't love him the way he loves me. But, but if it weren't that he loved me, I wouldn't be able to love him. How can you love him when you don't know him? And if you know him, how can you not love him? To know him is to love him, isn't it? Are you there? To know God is to love him. Say that. Now tell somebody next to you, I know God and I love him. Tell somebody. Did you listen to the other guy? It's good to say that. I know God and I love him. And the very moment I say I love him, I'm ready to go on my face and say, God, forgive me. I hardly even know what love is. But I do know that all things work together for good for me because I love him. And if we love him, that we'll be able to know. We can know that all things are working together for good. If we love him, it's because we know that he loves us. And when we know that he loves us, we know that he wouldn't harm us. Polycarp, one of the early bishops of the church, was one of the martyrs of the church. They took him to Rome. They finally found him and took him to Rome to make a spectacle of him as they put him to death. And they gave him a last chance. They said, Caesar is Lord. And all you have to do is renounce Jesus and claim that Caesar is Lord. So renounce Jesus. Polycarp said, he's been my king for 80 years and never done me any harm. How can I renounce him? Never did him any harm. Imagine saying that about God. He never did me any harm. What an understatement that is. He's causing everything to work together for good. For all of us who love him and who are called according to his good purposes. Now we can't always see the good. And not everything that happens is good. But he'll work it good 
and you have a little gift of hindsight, and you can look back and you can see all kinds of things. What can you see? Well, we have a son now. He's 31 years old. His name is Mark Alexander McCullough. We have a son who is 29 years old. His name is Winston Fontaine McCullough. And we have a daughter, 27 years old, Mary Lewis McCullough, soon to be Mary McCullough Ramirez. I love it. <laughs> well, sometimes things don't work out too well. Yes, it, yes, they do. It all works together for good. Well, it doesn't look like it. Well, stop looking at it. Look at him. See him. See him loving you. See him loving you. It's good for what ails you. And you start loving him, and you begin just simply knowing that all things are right now working together for good. I mentioned my son Mark when he was 13. He fell off a 50-foot cliff, landed on his head on a rock. He was in a coma for two and a half months. They said he'd never make it. And if he did, they couldn't guarantee what kind of life it would be. That means this kid hasn't got a chance, and if he makes it, he'll be a vegetable. But we had an earlier report. When we heard about it on the telephone, I was home. I heard about it. Alice was in the city at a memorial service for some a mutual CFO friend. And I felt that I should stay home for no reason, except that I just I had that sense that you get when God's got something he wants to do and I stayed home and the phone rang and I was told what had happened and I went into the living room and we sat down and prayed there were some friends there <clears throat> I said Lord I can't handle this I can't handle this this is impossible help me Lord help me and that's about it and I felt like something came down over me like a, a real filmy nightgown, or I, I don't know what gossamer is. Is gossamer some kind of material? Is it real light, just airy? That, I guess gossamer would be it. If I just knew what it was, I could say it was like gossamer came down over me. From the top of my head all the way to my feet, all the way to the floor. It was really a surprise. And I felt good. That was at 3 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, Alice came home, and I said, Alice, come with me. I took her down to the bottom of the basement steps and closed the door away from the crowd, and I told her what had happened. She said, oh. I said, let's pray. We prayed. She prayed pretty much what I did. When she got through asking God to help her, and then we looked at each other, she said, you know, the funniest thing just happened to me. She said, I felt like something came down over me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I said, that's the same thing that happened to me two hours ago. And we knew that we didn't have anything to worry about. When the doctor reported to us, we told Dr. Sachs, Dr. Ernest Sachs, the head of neurosurgery at Dartmouth Medical Center, Mary Hitchcock Hospital at Dartmouth University. He gave us the report in the elevator. And I said, Dr. Sachs, we really appreciate what you did. See, he operated on him for four and a half hours from 6 till 10.30. All he had was just a broken right clavicle and a bruised uh, ankle. But the, the big problem was the blow to the head. And he spent four and a half hours just picking bone out of his brain and cleaning up a lot of blood. And he told us the truth about Mark. And I thanked him. I said, I appreciate your telling us the truth in the, the sensitive way in which you 
have done this, and I'm grateful to you for the work you did, and for the nurses, and for the rescue squad, and the, all the, the lab technicians, and everybody who helped. We're really grateful, but I want you to know, Dr. Sachs, that, that God's got everything in control, and we're not worried. And I watched a, a doctor narrow his eyes. He told us later he thought we were on drugs. But uh, Mark recovered, and he graduated high school on time with a standing ovation. And his mom and dad, who had brought a movie camera to take pictures, never took the pictures. We were over in the bushes crying our eyes out, grateful to God. He's still a little spastic on one side. If you call him a spaz, you're partly right. But he doesn't drool anymore, and he is able to speak, and he can write, and he did graduate from Oral Roberts University, and he does have a job with the appellate division of the Supreme Court of the State of New York doing computer work setting up cases for upcoming uh, appeals cases. He has a little studio apartment 15 minutes north of us, and every day he walks 12 blocks to the train and rides to Grand Central Station. Then he gets the subway down to 25th Street and goes into the court, court building there. He's active in our church. Well, what was good about that? Well, several people came to faith in Jesus because of what they saw happening in our family. Everybody travailed for us and for Mark. And Alice and I had perfect peace. They did the travailing and they did the crying out to the Lord. And yes, we prayed, but we just, we just knew he was going to make it. It wasn't wishful thinking and it wasn't denial. I know what those are. I've had some of both. This was a knowing there's a time when you know it and you're knower, and that's a gift of faith. And that's what it was. I thought the Lord had, had stirred up within us the fruit of peace, peace like a river, you know. I thought that he'd given, he'd, that wasn't it. Later, as I thought back, I like to know the meaning of things. What meaneth this, Lord? I don't wear a gossamer. What is it? What was that? Why, what, what, where, what did it do? And I realized what he had done is he had poured out upon us a charism of faith wherein we knew what he wanted us to know, that Mark was going to make it no matter what anybody said and no matter what it looked like and where there was no way God made a way and made us to know that he would do that. And in having faith and trusting God and knowing that whatever happens is going to be good, man, you have peace. You just don't get all shook up when that happens. Doesn't always happen. And man, we had faith. All kinds of things going on. We were ministering to other people, and we weren't daffy. We were just as clear as could be. And as Mark got better and better and got more and more over everything, and he's still improving a little bit over a longer haul. But as he got to where he could function again and Everything worked out. We felt that thing lift off of us. I don't walk around having that kind of faith. I don't need that kind of faith. But when we need the faith, because a situation is impossible, all we do is we just go to God and say, God, I can't handle this. Help. That's an ancient early church prayer. Help. And God gives us what we need. And all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, even those who are called according to his good purpose. And we forgive the wounds. And if I had time, I would share with you about how Mitch died of a brain aneurysm. When I told him about Jesus, some years earlier, he said, I think you played too many games without a helmet. 
but uh, when he had a brain aneurysm, I visited him in the hospital, and I wore my clergy collar. And uh, I asked him, would it be all right if we pray together, pray for God to help? He said, yes, and we took hands. And uh, we prayed the Lord's Prayer together out loud, and then I prayed God would heal him. I, and I, I said, could we have communion together? He said, yes. So the next day I came down and brought my communion kit. We had communion together. And the last thing that happened uh, a few weeks later, when he could no longer speak, his mind was clear, but he couldn't make words anymore. And uh, everybody left. His wife left the room, and his children left the room, and his friends. And Alice and I stayed in for just about one minute longer. And Alice said, you know, Mitch, God loves you. And he twitched a little bit. And she said, and, and if you've ever done anything wrong, he, he'll forgive you. And he began to move around a little bit. And she said, and you know, you can ask Jesus to come into your heart, and he'll be your Lord and Savior, and he'll forgive you all your sins. And take you into his kingdom. And he really began thrashing around. I said, wait a minute, Alice. I said, Mitch, you already know that, don't you? And the last communication Mitch ever made was he did this. And the next time I saw him, he was unconscious. And I continued to lay hands on him for God to heal him. And he died at 10.30 on New Year's Eve as I sat with his wife at home in his house. I missed my New Year's Eve gig that night. But uh, I hope that he's with the Lord, and I prefer to believe that he is. That's my brother. A year later, my mother died of cancer, but she knew Jesus was in the empty chair in the room. She had always been afraid for God to be too close to her. And she'd never seen Jesus, but wanted to. Before she died, she knew he was sitting in the chair. And Alice said, how do you know? She said, because I see him. These things happen. Last piece of scripture, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we've been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, Though now for a little while you may have to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, may redound the praise and glory and honor to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Without seeing him, without having seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. As the outcome of your faith, you obtain the salvation of your souls. Jesus said, while you're in the world, you have tribulations. It gets pretty hairy. But there's nothing, nothing, that God can't heal if we choose to forgive the wounds. And don't, don't nail it on God too long. I'm just suffering for Jesus. Hey, don't blame that stuff on Jesus. and Don't claim to be suffering for Jesus. When you suffer for Jesus when you share 
the good news about the kingdom and people reject you. That's when you suffer for Jesus. But everybody suffers this stuff. Everybody loves somebody and they die. Everybody loves somebody and then they're, they're um, handicapped. We're all handicapped. Every one of us came from a dysfunctional family. Everybody born into this world is born into a dysfunctional family. In some way or other, we all have our handicaps and we all have our tragedies. But there's a kind of person that says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And Father, I don't know why these things are happening in life. Oh, but I forgive the wounds. And it changes things. The redwood tree forgives a wound and builds a burl upon it from which a craftsman makes a bowl as lovely as a sonnet. From this I learn, if I'm wise, to be alike forgiving and build within my wounded heart a loveliness of living. And then God will make of my true heart just like the redwood story with his great love and craftsmanship a chalice to his glory. <laughs> uh, no wonder we say, thanks be to God who causes us always to triumph in Christ Jesus. You know what? We're part of the household, and in this game, the house wins. <laughs> always. Always. Anybody you might need to forgive? Any situation didn't turn out the way you wanted it to? You were doing your best to create the world in your image and it didn't happen? Well, right now, just say to God, I can't handle it. Help. Help me, God. I can't do it. I can't make it. But with you, I can make it. Help me. Help me. Lord, I want to forgive that person, but I can't. All right. Lord, make us able. Enable us to forgive. Through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. All right, now we're able. Father, forgive, you fill in the name. Father, I forgive, you fill in the name. And forgive me for waiting so long. I forgive the wounds. And thank you for the privilege, Lord. In the great healing name of Jesus our forgiver, and our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's get to our feet and pray the 9 o'clock prayer. Tonight it'll be the 907 prayer. But uh, have no fear. Somewhere right now it's 9 o'clock. The Lord be with you. I didn't like that. The Lord be with you. And also with you. I thought you believed that one. Let us pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let there be peace on earth. And let it begin with me. Amen.